Most of us are familiar with the name Webster being synonymous with dictionary. Today I want to explain why that's the case. I want to give the history of Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary. This is an amazing resource and one which I am extremely thankful for, both as an American but more importantly as a Latter-day Saint. To motivate this topic, I want to talk about a verse that second, given in 2 Nephi, chapter 31, verse 3. And I want to highlight the end of this verse, the part that I've, that's highlighted in red. Here Nephi tells us that God speaks unto men according to their language, unto their understanding. That is, God is not going to use a language that we don't understand. He's going to use our language. Now, this is relevant for our discussion today because we can think about when the Latter-day Scriptures are given. So the Book of Mormons published in 1830. The Doctrine and Covenants, most of the sections at least, come between 1829 and 1844. The Pearl of Great Price is mostly given in the 1830s and 1840s. So Latter-day scriptures are all coming in the 1830s and 1840s. This is important and relevant because Webster's Dictionary was published in 1828. Now there's lots to be said about this dictionary, but I want to highlight three significant points. The first is that Webster's 1828 Dictionary was an American dictionary. Dictionaries at the time, at least English dictionaries, focused on how the language was used in England, in Britain. Webster explicitly wanted to create an American dictionary for the English language, how Americans wrote and spoke this language. This is great for us because Joseph Smith was American and would have used that language when, or God would have used that language with him when providing these revelations. The second point is that Webster's 1828 dictionary was a religious dictionary. Now, I don't mean that it was designed only to be used for religious words. In fact, it's not. But it was religious in that Webster wanted to help people understand uh, the religious language, to understand the Bible. And this is important for us because he's helping us understand how Americans in his time period would have used religious language which means that it helps us understand how Joseph Smith would have understood religious language. So what a great resource for us. Finally, I want to make the third point that it was a comprehensive dictionary. It had a huge number of words, 70,000, and it had an extensive etymology providing the background and a deeper understanding of where these words came from and, and how they uh, got to us. It, pro it provided so much detail because Webster poured himself into this. This was his magnus opus. He spent more than 25 years to produce and publish this uh, dictionary. In the process, he learned 28 languages so he could give the etymology of words. And not only did he pour his time and his talent, his, he also poured his financial resources into this. The first edition actually failed to be uh, a financial success. It only sold 2.5 thousand copies. He mortgaged his home and lived in debt to produce the second edition. He, he really put his fortune, he was, um, I believe, inspired to put in his, his all, his resources, um, both mental, physical, time, and financial into the creation of this document. And I, I think we are particularly blessed to have this because it provides us a chance to uh, understand the language the language of the scriptures as they were given to Joseph Smith. Now, you can buy a hard copy, uh, which is pretty neat, um, but you can also you look online and find this resource. So if you go to Webster's Dictionary 1828.com, you'll see a screen should look something like this, at least as of 2014. The homepage looks like this. And there they have a box where you can enter terms and search. And what I want to do now is do show you how, uh, with some verses that we're all familiar with, how doing this can provide some potentially new insights. So here we are. This is LDS.org. The scriptures were in Doctrine and Covenants, section 121. This shows roughly verses 42 through 46. And you can see I've highlighted three words, reproving, sharpness, and garnish. And I've also written those words on the right side of the screen. 
what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and go over to Webster's 1828 dictionary and we're going to go ahead and search for these words and just see how they are defined in his dictionary. Now reprove, when I typically think of this word, I think of it as having a uh, harsh contact. And in some sense, that is one of the defi definitions, to blame, to censure. But it can also mean, and I like this definition a lot, to convince of a fault or to make manifest. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that over here. Now sharpness also has a um, harsh tone. And some of the definitions indeed have or fit with that harsh tone. But it also has a simple definition of being not obtuseness. So something that might be obtuse is something that we have a hard time understanding. And so to be sharp is also just to be clear, to be explain what, it, what your point is. Now this third point, garnish. When I think of garnish, the first definition fits with how I typically think of it. To adorn, to decorate with appendages. So we might garnish something with flowers. So it sounds kind of like just a little bit on top, around the edges. But the third definition here has a much more powerful, uh, um, much more forceful definition. Garnish can mean to furnish or supply as a fort garnished with troops. That sounds much more active, much more um, forceful. Let's go back with those potential definitions in mind and look at DNC 121 again. So verse 43 here re reads, reproving the times with sharpness. Well, again, I would typically have read that as meaning kind of uh, chastising with kind of harshness. Well, it could also potentially mean that we want to help convince of a fault with exactness by explaining what we mean. So that way, that and I like that definition. It's it still it has a much softer uh, and and also clarifies that the point here is potentially to make clear what aspect it is that we're trying to offer feedback on. Now let's go to verse 45. The verse reads, Let thy bowels also be full of charity towards all men and to the household of faith, and let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Now, again, one definition of garnish is something that is uh, much kind of garnish is something you've kind of put on the top. It's, it's decorative. Here, an alternative is something that's much more forceful, at least to me as I read it. It's to furnish to supply as a fort garnished with troops. And so we want varnished, we want virtue to, to be kind of much more forcefully supplied uh, to our thoughts unceasingly. This sounds much more proactive. And um, I like that definition. Now, there are obviously a lot more definitions that are, or places you could look. So if we go back uh, just this month, there are several verses that you could use this resource to learn about. Um, these are just some of the ones for December 2014 that we'll talk about in class. So in DNC section four, the word might. You might look that up and just see how does the word might used in 1828? What are some of the definitions? Um, in Jacob chapter one, the words magnify and errand. What do those words mean? DNC 25, the word cleave. What does cleave mean? Um, how is it used? How about DNC 1, verse 23, the word simple. For DNC 100, the word confound. For Ether 1227, the word sufficient. These are, there's, these are just a start. There are lots of words out there um, that, and lots of insights to be gained. More than anything, I have a great appreciation for what Noah Webster did to provide us this resource. And uh, I hope that we certainly will use it this month in our class. And more importantly, I hope you'll use it in your own study to learn more about the Latter-day Scriptures we have.